Hello and welcome to another episode of Not Too Deep. I'm your host, Grace Helbig, and I'm very excited slash nervous because on today's episode, we have me, Grace Helbig. I am the host and the guest. It's just me by myself, me, myself, and I, with you, yourself, and you. And uh, I've never done this before. And it feels very strange already, but also familiar. Who knows? Uh, This is happening like this because Not Too Deep with Grace Helbig, me, host and guest, is taking a hiatus after this episode for a bit. The exact amount of time has not been determined because I have a hard time making concrete decisions. We'll get into all of that in this episode. Um, Yeah, we're taking a hiatus for a little bit. And I thought before we did that, I would try something I've never done before, something I'm scared of, but something that challenges me and also kind of excites me because I've never done that, which is just talking to you by myself. There's no crutches. There's no safety nets. However, I am, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, I'm not in my normal office in my house that I record in. I'm down in Palm Springs. I had to come down here for some things, and the timing of it uh, was that this is where I'm recording the final episode, so it's kind of appropriate. I feel a little displaced from where I normally am, um, which kind of mirrors emotionally and creatively how I'm experiencing myself in the world at this point in time. Um, It's very fun down here because we don't have any desks in the Palm Springs house, so I have all my things set up the way I used to record YouTube videos in hotel rooms on an ironing board right here. Uh, And then I have a dresser pulled over to my right that has my laptop on it. Uh, And I have a half drank can of Red Bull. Uh, That doesn't really change. I am a bit over caffeinated and still feel tired. Um, So this is bound to be uh, an incredible episode all the way around. And she sips. So I wanted to do this because I have some thoughts about things and stuff that felt like this was the more appropriate medium to kind of explore them and say them out loud instead of just constantly rattling them around in my brain. And then I went on good old, reliable, soul-fulfilling social media, and I asked you guys if you had any questions or topics or things that you would be interested on me touching on. And so I've incorporated a lot of those questions and things that you guys have asked into what I want to talk about today. I didn't want this to feel scripted, um, but I did want to be prepared, so I wrote eight pages of notes here. And after I wrote these eight pages of notes, I felt like, ha, oh, I did it. There you go. There's everything I need to say. Um, but then I haven't actually done it until right now. So we're going to get into these notes, uh, skillfully kind of crafted with your suggestions. And I thank you all so much for them. So let's just do it. This is me rambling and bantering to avoid just doing it. So this, I think, is our 349th episode. I thought maybe 350, but not quite, but still 349 episodes of a podcast. Um, That might be the time <laughs> that it's <laughs> appropriate to take a bit of a hiatus, a bit of a break. Not Too Deep started back in 2014. And now we're almost eight years later. And yeah, that's when I realized it's time to take a break. Um, That's how long it usually takes me to come to the full understanding that I'm a bit tired and should (laughs) step away from something. A lot of you wanted to know why the hiatus, obviously, first and foremost. And to that, I say, why do we stop doing anything? Maybe we're tired. Doesn't feel great anymore. Someone told you to stop, (laughs) which wasn't the case here. Um, 
overall, usually it's because your relationship with something has changed. Maybe it's plateaued. Maybe it's worsened. Maybe the balance in the effort versus outcome versus the experience of it is off in some way. And that's kind of where I'm at. I've learned that examining our relationship with um, people and things and, and the way we exist in the world is becoming, to me, it's clarifying as one of the most important things to kind of analyze. And just forewarning that this episode might be kind of a stream of consciousness, kind of a TED talk, kind of a pep talk, kind of a rant, a rambling, a soapbox monologue. Um, but for me, these are just some of my thoughts and you can determine what package you're experiencing them in. So let's get into, I've already said we need to examine our relationships and that's what we're going to be doing throughout this, examining relationships with ourselves, with our family, with the world, with our work. Everything we engage in is about nurturing relationships with it. It's about the the, in, the, the thing in between, not, not the you or the thing necessarily, the, the, the thing you have with it. <laughs> Again, uh, some of this might not make any sense to you. I haven't done any fine-tuning. This is just kind of first draft thoughts. So let's segue into one of the more popular areas of conversation to talk about, which is and was my decision to go back to school. If you don't know, I am currently in a graduate program, um, which has recently changed its name. It's currently called Depth Psychology and Creativity. Very cool. Very fun. Very exciting. Very amorphous. Very what is that? Uh, and I'm kind of in the middle of it. I'm, I should be finishing up by the, uh, the fall this year, which is wild, that it will have been two years. I decided to take on this new uh, experience back in the summer of 2020. And a lot of you wanted to know about my decision to go back to school, um, why I chose the program that I did, etc. So I, in the summer of 2020, I think a lot of us realized everything was a bit out of control, things were changing, a lot of um, difficult to process stuff was going on, uh, and that's when I kind of was able to really concretize for myself that my relationship with my work was just so off. There was some imbalance, there was something not fulfilling, something very forced and stuck, and um, just uh, wasn't, the, the joy wasn't there the way that it used to be. And uh, we talk so much about relationships. I have a hard time recognizing when a relationship is a little imbalanced because I am a codependent Libra. And when I'm in a relationship with anything, I will use my hyper anxiety mind thoughts to try to force it to work out. I'll just think about the fact in a relationship that something feels off. And I'll just loop those anxiety thoughts over and over and over and over and over, thinking that maybe that'll fix it, you know. Just that uh, that amount of effort will probably fix it. And I will tell you that I've had a 0% success rate with that method. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't stop me from trying. It is my default go-to. Uh, but that summer 2020, I finally decided to try something different. I needed structure. I needed an intellectual challenge. I needed to kind of broaden the bubble that I had been... Um, not so peacefully existing in, uh, which is how I found this step psychology and creativity program. I've always been interested in psychology, but I knew that I didn't want to get into clinical psychology. I didn't want to go into advertising. <laughs> I didn't want to go into corporate psychology, which lands you in some sort of HR type of department. Um, I think maybe the underlying thing is I just didn't want to deal with other people, which is important to recognize in your introverted self. Uh, but I wanted to study creativity, which I felt like I had used to have such a beautiful blossoming relationship with and just had felt like it was, you know, round peg square hole for me and creativity. And how are you going to fuck with that? You can't. It hurts. <laughs> 
So I found depth psychology and creativity and it kind of touched on a lot of things that I was interested in learning about uh, while still maintaining a creative environment in which I could dabble in making things and processing um, academic information artistically, which is what I've been doing. A lot of people wanted to know, what is it like being in a graduate program? What's it like going back to school after not being in school for a decade? And I'm sure a lot of you out there are currently in master's programs, PhD programs, to which I say, coo fucking dose. It is a real challenge. And it is um, very humbling, I will say, is one of the things I, I'm truly recognizing is that to be back in a learning environment after spending the last decade eating pudding out of diapers for views and calling it a job <laughs> is humbling. I think I've only eaten the pudding diaper situation one time, just to be clear. Um, but I'm sure the internet obviously can give you the facts on that. Uh, I've been working in YouTube and content creation for so long it was my only world. It was the only thing that I knew how to do or knew how to be in. And I started to not know how to do it or to feel like I didn't know how to do it and to feel like I didn't know how to be in it. Um, and so I needed something outside of it to potentially re-stimulate ideas within it. But um, I'm in school. <laughs> Another thing that I've realized about being back in school um, is how vulnerable it is. You really don't know what you don't know until you start to learn things that you definitely don't know. And that's how I feel in school. I've, you know, kind of made this slogan for myself, I don't know, online. Um, and you really, you know, thoughts are things. Be careful what you manifest, guys, because that has become <laughs> very true for me. But the vulnerable exciting side of that is recognizing what you don't know and how that can be an exciting thing versus a um, degrading thing. Like, I'm so stupid. No, this is like I get to learn all this stuff I didn't realize I didn't even know and see how the domino effect of it reacting to the things I already know and have experienced, what comes out then? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I've also learned by being back in school a lot about my relationship with procrastination. Anyone out there a procrastinator? Yeah, I, my name is Grace Helbig and I am a procrastinator. Um, me and procrast are BFFs, but I've realized that they really bring out the worst in me. <laughs> procrastination for me is a bit of a fickle temptress that tells me perhaps your time is best spent playing Scrabble Go all day, every day. And though that sounds correct, it is not. I have learned in practice. Uh, and that's kind of what I was doing before I signed up for school. I was just sort of avoiding existing in a creative sense. I was um, trying to run away from the friction of it. I was spending so much time just on mindless things, sort of hiding from the world. And I needed to actually challenge myself to participate again and for me this was the best way to start dipping my toe back into it um along with that a lot of people ask questions about how do you find motivation to work or to study how do you find a balance and I recently talked about this with Mamrie um on a bonus pod that we did maybe it's weird to Talk about the other podcast you do while you're doing one of the uh, last before break episodes of a, a different podcast currently. But I don't know for me if hearing um, the way other people handle their procrastination necessarily helps me. But for those that it does help to hear the way other people handle their procrastination, um, I'm still figuring that out. I think... The best way I can glean uh, that you can deal with procrastination is to really get introspective with yourself and figure out 
or at least start to try to figure out what is the emotion that is causing this delay for me to action? Um, what ego feeling is getting activated that is trying to protect me from doing whatever X, Y, and Z is that I want to do, but I can't find myself doing. I kind of think of it a little bit like when you have all these tangled um, headphone cords and you just sit and you spend time sitting and actually really untangling them. That's kind of the work that you need to do to understand and potentially shift your relationship with procrastination. That's all to say that I haven't totally figured it out for myself. I'm recording this podcast now down in Palm Springs because I procrastinated on doing it up uh, in Los Angeles because I think I was scared of wanting to make it perfect or, you know, holding it on this pedestal of having all this gravitas about it being so significant to me and I want it to be significant to you, but then I also want it to be candid and cool and casual and that'll keep you from ever doing anything, at least for me. Um, hopefully that helps with procrastination. Another big uh, question as it pertained to school was, what do I plan on doing um, with this education in the future? And like I said, I, I don't wanna do a clinical route. I can't be anyone's therapist. This is as close as I will get to that, at least for right now. Uh, but I can't see myself in that world. And I, I don't have any concrete ideas at this moment of exactly what I'm going to do. And that's, for me, was one of the challenging things. Because I'm very much a conclusion kind of person. I want to know what, what's the thing I'm going to do with this? How can I use this? And I think that is so conditioned in me from making YouTube videos and content for so long. So you're constantly thinking about how can I monetize this? How can I um, make content out of this? And it was so wrapped up in like, how do I make something for my career out of this versus how do I just experience this? And so that for me is where I'm at. I'm trying to challenge myself to be present in my schoolwork and experience it and try my best without worrying constantly about what the benefit will be in the long run from this. Because if I keep thinking in the future, I'm missing the rewards in the present. Easier said than done. <laughs> Take that as the whole through line of everything I'm saying here. That this is easy to say and intellectualize, difficult to put into practice and internalize. Um, but I'm hoping that my education is helping support and nurture my own creativity. Um, I've really learn that I like making things and I love making people laugh and not being afraid to admit that for myself has been huge and truly was the foundation of why I ever got into comedy in the first place and you get really away from those core values when you get in this world where there's so much stimulus and so and everything's so high octane all the time um I feel like I had lost my soul to social media a bit and I'm, I'm trying to rediscover that through academia now. Um, if you come to any of the This Might Get Weird live shows, you might be able to see me doing a little bit more about that in a more uh, formal comedy space. <laughs> Again, sorry if it's strange to promote stuff from another podcast on this current podcast, but... <sighs> Many plates, uh, which is a great segue into a lot of questions that came in about my thoughts on YouTube, social media, um, where it was, where it's at now. I think it's pretty obvious that this is something I have been obsessively thinking about recently as I ask almost every single guest that's on Not Too Deep about their relationships with social media, and everyone seems to have a heavy sigh before they elaborate on how they feel, and that's where I'm at too. More on that after this quick break. We'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. 
And me, your host, Grace Helvig. With me, your guest, Grace Helvig. Welcome back to Not Too Deep with me, your host, Grace Helbig, and me, your guest, Grace Helbig. As I was saying, social media, my relationship with it. Um, yeah, I got very much into asking every other guest that was on Not Too Deep about their relationship with it um, because I have my own personal experience and thoughts on it, but I uh, find comfort and interest and I have such curiosity about how other people are managing their relationships with it. And like I said, about every single guest had some sort of heavy sigh, complicated relationship with social media. And the ones that didn't, I think, were like 19. So <laughs> they'll get there over time. Uh, okay, social media is a double-edged sword, in my opinion. Um, it has opportunities for connections in ways that we could never feel before. Um, and with that, it also gives you a beautiful opportunity to dissociate and distance yourself from who you are at your core. Um, we get to share ideas and art freely. And we also, in my opinion, get to slowly start coveting a false sense of worth and identity. <laughs> Listen to this, okay? The internet is a place where you can be seen and scrutinized, entertained and empty, supported and sexualized, cherished and canceled, delighted and depressed, obsessed and overwhelmed, nostalgic and numb all at once. Maybe that's just me. <laughs> but that is wild. This place is a tension of opposites. There's good, there's bad, there's... Uh, everything in between. Can't recommend enough watching Bo Burnham's Inside. He explains his relationship with social media, with comedy, with entertainment, with performative arts and performative life uh, so viscerally and wonderfully. Viscerally? Visceral word to say. Um... Yeah, the internet and social media to me are a beautifully dangerous place <laughs> for one's ego, for oneself, for one's idea of um, authenticity, especially. Oh, that word. <laughs> that word fills me with cringe these days. I was trying to figure out kind of a hearkening back to the self-help books that I've written in the past, which is still wild to me that that's something I made and did. Um, but I, in those books, used a lot of wordplay for you to understand the really important core concepts in it. And I came up with here that you can't spell authenticity without thy anti-cutie the Shakespearean way of saying that this overarching, overarching, overarching strive for authenticity makes me feel like thy anti-cutie. I don't feel cute after a while of desperately trying to figure out how to be authentic. I, I feel like in the initial stages of content creation and internet dabbling, Authenticity and transparency, obviously, were the core ingredients to a successful interaction with an audience or a successful building of a brand that could be trusted by people who could assume that they understood exactly who you were and they weren't being lied to or played or anything like that. But I get nervous now that this idea of authenticity has been so diluted because we're just trying to figure out how to be authentic online versus just being. <laughs> um, and so the internet, oh, here's what I wrote. The internet basically made me feel bad for a while. I think a lot of us are having these dips in and out of 
the beauty and the the beast of interacting um in these mediums someone asked me um about a piece of advice that i regret putting out there and i can't say that off the top of my head i know any piece of advice that i regret because i forget everything immediately and tend to repress things that um are regretful <laughs> but i can say that i would um I would amend a lot of advice that I had put out there. I had spent years being on panel after panel at, at convention after convention talking and squawking and quacking about authenticity, transparency, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. And I think I would amend with that that, yes, those things do mean a lot when it comes to being yourself in any capacity. But with that, I think you should equally honor your own introspection um be as authentic and transparent with yourself on why you dabble with the digital devil <laughs> that's too harsh we'll call it a digital demon um i like the i've started thinking like no wonder it's called internet worldwide web these are things meant to catch prey <laughs> from predators and I think a lot of us can get uh, caught in the web and the net um, and lose a real sense of the world and ourselves. It's also called the information superhighway or cyberspace and I don't know about any of you but I don't think I have the capacity to successfully be on a superhighway or in space for long periods of time. So I recommend taking your breaks, examining your relationships with uh, this medium and really connecting to your why, why you're participating, why, what are you getting, um, how does it make you feel, and know that if it doesn't feel good, you have a means to change that. Again, easier said than done. I'm still working on creating those boundaries for myself, understanding where to put those boundaries, and, um, and then, you know, YouTubing how to set up a, an emotional fence. <laughs> Thank God you can learn everything on the internet, right? Um, okay, I need everyone to look around real quick. I think I lost my point. Ayo! It's not all serious, soapboxy, talk, talk, squawk, squawk. Uh, but yes. The internet was making me feel stuck and soulless. I've already hit on that many, 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 many times. Um, maybe this is the way that you feel. Uh, maybe you don't because you have a better relationship with the internet and that's great for you. Like I said, I'm still experiencing and understanding it, but I do know that I couldn't experience this type of bitterness, for lack of a better word, without knowing the sweet taste of how it felt to make content when I started. That was a joyfully pure era that I am so thankful to have been there for. I'm talking, you know, 2010 to 20, I don't know, you know, the 10, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. those were some fun years. And thank you for being around there for it. If you were there, I'm sure you know this smile and joy that I feel from it because you do too. It's hard to actually kind of verbally transcribe what that felt like. Um, but it's really, really sweet to look back on how sweet it was. And that's what made it sweet is that you didn't even know in that moment in those years how pure everything was until it got a bit tainted. <laughs> Again, just my opinion. Um, I also think with that, that nostalgia is a tricky thing, at least for me. Um, nostalgia for me is like really, 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 really old leftovers. <laughs> really old leftovers. Like they're best appreciated for what they were in the prime state that they were in. But if you keep trying to eat them, <laughs> you're going to get sick. 
And trust me, this is a metaphor that I understand metaphorically and also literally my gastrointestinal system uh, has been really eating those nostalgic leftovers <laughs> for a long time, which is also one of the reasons that I, I really wanted to go to school and create new experiences instead of, you know, dwelling so much in the, in the past. Again, I don't want to get preachy. I put in my notes a lot of times about not getting preachy. I think that's also due in part to the sensitive nature that um, the internet has has become. Don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, but let's dabble in a little bit of nostalgia. A lot of people was uh, a lot of people was asking. A lot of people were asking, how has not too deep changed over the eight years? Uh, it's changed a lot. I remember it started in 2014 in response to Rhett and Link were doing a podcast and they were one of the first people that I knew of that were um, digital creators dabbling in a podcast format that digital creators weren't really, you know, expressing themselves in. And their podcast was very personal, and very deep. And so I wanted to make the anti version of that. Hence, not too deep. And so it started completely superfluous, just surface, only in the shallow end. Um, in the shallow. And then that's where the song stops uh, for me at that time. And that was great and very fun. Um, but as I grew as a person and realized again that I, you know, find people endlessly curious, I wanted to start wading into the deep end a little bit um, and really getting to know people and also <laughs> when you realize that putting people on the spot with really arbitrary questions um, doesn't make them very comfortable <laughs> and as someone that really desperately wants to make people comfortable and seen uh, I was doing myself a disservice by kind of staying in that level. So we've gotten deeper over the years. I'm sure you noticed that if you have been consistent listeners. People asked about my favorite guests. Oh man, we've had 349 episodes. It's very difficult to remember all of them, but some standouts for me, Chelsea Handler, Bob Saget was amazing. Um, John Green, a recent conversation we had just kind of talking about the internet was very nail on head for where my brain hammer was at with all of it. Um, and there's and so many more. Those are just a couple quick that came to mind. But every conversation has been has had something for me afterwards that I've walked away going, wow, that was really great. Even if before we started recording, I was a nervous wreck or felt unprepared or something. I realized, too, with all of this, when I was writing all of this, that I do have such deep appreciation for all of the guests because really when you zoom out and you think about the experience of being a guest on a podcast with a host that you mm, haven't met for the most part, um, it's a wild situation to put yourself in. So I have such appreciation for strangers <laughs> trusting me to hold a safe space for an unedited conversation for you know 45 minutes that's awkward and for people to kind of put themselves in that <laughs> that's very cool and I'm very thankful my natural resting state is anxious and awkward so perhaps I have gotten a little burnout <laughs> on that aspect of it but one of the biggest things I've taken away from doing not too deep this was a question someone had is the importance in life for seeing others and for lifting them up, which is a real facet I've tried to infuse into every episode is really making my guests feel seen. Um, if you have areas in your life that you're doing that, bravo. If you have opportunities to do that, I couldn't recommend it more. Um, as someone that finds such um, sweet, vulnerable joy in being seen and appreciated, uh, I, I desperately want to do that for others. And this has given me an amazing platform to be able to do that. So that really great. Um, the other biggest kind of thing I've appreciated and learned is the value in staying curious, 
To me, curiosity comes without judgment, and to wonder is an act of generosity. To wonder without judgment about someone is a beautiful thing. Uh, and I'm thankful to have a space to have done that here and hope to do that more in the future. Um, do you know what else is beautiful? Taking a break from this sermon for a moment, a moment, to get into some random questions because that's how Not Too Deep started. Anyway, so we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to wrap this episode up with just some of the more lighthearted questions that you guys asked me on the social media. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. Not Too Deep with Grace Albeck. And we're back just like that. Um, man, I really thought that I would have to record this episode again and again and again because I would get too nervous that I haven't said things correctly in the way that I want to. And that's maybe true. Um, there's a lot here that I've been going through that, again, is like rough draft thoughts that I probably could write and say more about. I was also worried that this was going to be 10 minutes uh, and it would breeze by. But here we are, this deep into not too deep. And um, thank you for listening to basically kind of the sermon preachy, lectury, um, whatever -y kind of thought section of it. Again, plenty more to say there, but maybe something was of value and interesting for you. Now on to just some quick hits of random questions you guys had. Someone asked horror stories about making HelloFresh. Do I have any horror stories about making HelloFresh? Um, not really horror stories other than I uh, chopped off the top of my thumb cutting scallions um, one time making a HelloFresh meal. And that has stuck with me because it was a visceral. I felt like I had cut into a chunk of meat, which I did, my skin thumb meat. And I won't forget what that <laughs> ooh sensation was like. It hasn't stopped me from making HelloFresh. It also, I think, was a little bit in part to the fact that I was sipping on a weed cocktail before that. And that might not have aided in me being as present as I could with the scallions and the knife, which also lends itself into questions people asked about me getting more into weed and marijuana in the last couple years, which I have. Um, for me, again, it's all just personal experience, preference, thoughts. I have enjoyed it very much as a highly anxious and nervous person that has felt in a very changing place in their adult lives where it feels like maybe nothing's happening but everything is changing <laughs> it's the best way I can articulate that uh and that produces a lot of anxiety in me and marijuana has um helped me kind of calm myself down um my usual kind of escapism route has always been drinking and that I don't love as much anymore and marijuana has been able to allow me just a, a little bit of a sense of, of calming down without being destructive <laughs> to say the least um, so I've really enjoyed it but I'm also a bit of a puss about it and I'm a pretty moderate weed smoker mild I like the weed drinks because I do still like the physical activity of drinking i'll take a sip of my red bull to confirm <sighs> gorgeous but that's been really fun for me um and i cannot believe how broad and uh, amazing the weed and cannabis industry is and it's growing like crazy in the products i'm a sucker for products and new innovations freaking love Shark Tank and the whole cannabis industry just feels like a constant parade of new Shark Tank products and I'd like to invest in them all. For those reasons, I'm in. <laughs> um, so that's where I'm at with that. I don't know if that even answered any question. Um, 
Someone wants to know qualities I seek in the perfect snack food. Oof. Oof. This does play hand in hand to the marijuana thing because I do find myself quite the snack monster at night, which is my favorite endeavor to just be in the comfort of my own home. Now under a weighted blanket, just chomping away at something that um, doesn't feed my soul, feeds my actual stomach. Uh, and I love a crunch. I love chips. I love eating cereal. <laughs> this might be gross to you guys. Dry cereal straight out of the box with my hands. Like a little raccoon that got into the Airbnb and is just making the best of it. Um, that's one of my favorite things at night. <laughs> Uh, so I like snack foods that offer textural elements that also I can eat with my body utensils, my fingers. Uh, someone wanted to know my thoughts on aliens. Uh, my thoughts on aliens are that, uh, I, I don't think, well, I don't have very profound, academically rigorous thoughts on aliens other than I bet they're out there. Uh, I bet they're probably nice and super smart. And if they wanted to destroy us, they would have done it already. Um, so who knows? But also, I know that we don't know shit about fuck when it comes to everything. And that maybe people are hiding information from us. But who am I to rule out any particular thing? I like to think of it that they're out there and they're probably really nice. <laughs> and those are my thoughts on aliens for now. Someone wanted to know, if dogs wore pants, would they wear them on two or four legs? Wow, very intense question. Um, I, oof, would dogs wear them on two or four legs? Man, if you don't get high and really think about that, because that is a mental Rubik's Cube that I don't know if you can solve for yourself. Uh, I would say I'm going to go two legs is just my initial response because seeing I've seen you know photos of the dogs that wear the four-legged um, onesies which look very cute and also look make them look very vulnerable um, so I think out of dignity and respect to dogs I will go two legs but front <laughs> uh, someone asked would I ever be on celebrity big brother answer is absolutely hard no absolutely not I don't think I could ever be on any reality program. I think being on social media is being on an amateur reality television show and it hasn't made me feel good. So <laughs> I don't have the brain capacity to be on them, but I do have the brain capacity to enjoy them. Like I can go to an art gallery and love all the paintings, but I couldn't do any of that. And can you believe that I just related reality programming to uh, fine art? <laughs> I can, because those are the two worlds that uh, my brain resides in, perhaps. And then the last question that we'll get into here, because I don't want it to be all pessimistic. Uh, my intentions are, go are good. My intentions are good with this episode. Uh, someone wanted to know something about the Internet that makes me happy. Well, that's a lovely way to spin this back up again. Um, something about the internet that makes me happy is that it truly has provided, like I said earlier, a means by which we can connect and not feel alone that we have never experienced before. I think everyone wants to feel some sense of connection or understanding. And the internet really has been able to do that um, in a way that you you couldn't before. That's not to say that there's that can be too risky. <laughs> but you've already heard me talk about that for the last hour. Uh, and that the internet gives um, artists and creatives ways in which their work can be seen by others that has never existed before. And I think it gives people that might not have been thinking of themselves as artists or creators a way in which to see themselves. It just, there are tons of positives to the internet and there are lots of negatives. But <laughs> this question's about the happy things. And I'm really happy that it has allowed me to create and put myself out there in a way that 
I look back and can't believe that I've done. Um, and I, I truly don't like, I can't believe that I had the courage like to do so much shit for so long when sometimes I feel so lost and afraid and, uh, small and stupid. Um, and so I, I encourage everyone <laughs> that has interest in making things online to make things online and everything that I have said about my burnt current state of burnout is only coming from my current years of experience around all of this. I'm sure, again, speaking to relationships, cultivating your healthy relationship with it um, is key. And that segues to the future. What's going to happen in the future? Uh, I don't know. To keep the themes rolling, I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. This podcast will be taking a break. I'd like to finish up focusing on school um, with less other things going on. And I'd like to process my school so that I can really be present for my future as paradoxical as that sounds um so I don't know but I hope you're here for it whatever that might be and with that I want to give some big thanks and if you need podcasts to listen to without not too deep there obviously this might get weird this podcast I do with my friend Mamrie Hart comes out every Wednesday, uh, and that will still be rolling, rolling, rolling. I'm going to get, um, this is now going to get taken down for copyright infringement. And I also, first of all, first of all, we're at the end. Uh, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to Melissa, my producer, director. You guys know her. She is absolutely incredible, and she produces and co-hosts uh, podcast that you should absolutely go put your ears and eyes on uh, in the meantime if you haven't already. Also, big shout out to Diane Kang, who used to be my assistant years ago, but has for the last few years been working on this podcast with me in the background. She's created all of the research packets for every guest I have. So everything that I am able to know about them she has uh, been providing for me throughout the years, and I can't say thank you enough to her. And she is now working with Melissa, so go support that team of wonderfully powerful, incredible women making great content that I think you should and can enjoy. Uh, and then lastly, a huge thank you to all of you for... This, I mean, this sounds like I'm going away forever. That's, that's not true. Uh, but I just have to be appreciative and show how much gratitude I have for you by saying it here that I'm so thankful for you engaging with any of the things that I've made over the years or in the future or I'm right now. Thank you for listening to this episode. It might have been a little all over the place. Maybe it made sense. Maybe it didn't. But it's there and it's done-ish. <laughs> and I thank you for all of the sweet wishes and sentiments you guys have sent. I'm learning to accept sweet feelings. And it does make me feel vulnerable. Uh, uh, but I, I am so overwhelmed and thankful for it. And I wish you all the best in doing the best you can. Because that's all you can do. Um... Again, thank you. I wrote out eight pages of notes and I didn't write any quippy way to end this episode. So I will just continue to ramble until the end. Thanks for listening to this episode of Not Too Deep. We'll see you next time at some point in the near to distant future. Goodbye. Too deep, too deep, too deep, not too deep. It was Grace Helbig. Not Too Deep is a production of Grace Helbig Incorporated, producer Melissa D. Montz, edited by Shireen Lani Yunus, post-production sound by Chris Henry, and an extra special thanks to Flula for the theme music. <laughs> <laughs>